All right, friends and neighbors, welcome back. Today, we are continuing our journey into Linux networking with bridging bridge groups and virtual bridging. A very exciting aspect of the under the hood sort of networking stuff that you can do with various types of connections. Now, first up, we have the root of all bridging as we know it, and that is the IEEE, the Institute for Electronic and Electrical Engineers standard 802.1D. Now, today we use 802.1Q, but 802.1D is where it all started, and this is the definition of store and forward bridging. So the whole point of a network bridge is to connect segments together. Now, when we do that, we get a whole bunch of benefits. Previously, we were doing hubs or repeaters. Now, the bridge makes decisions based on MAC addresses. It has a source address table. It stores the MAC addresses that it knows or that it learns because it's watching the traffic. The big thing that the bridge brings to us is it's a network extension technique. So where previously we had some physical distance limitations because of the collision domain, now we expand the size of the network because we can put a bridge in between there and we get a collision domain on either side. So automatically we get that. But as I said, the bridge makes decisions based on MAC address. And so in the graphic above me, we see that PC1 and PC2 are sort of on one side. And what this means is that PC1 and PC2 can have a conversation and PC3 doesn't have to listen to it unless we're talking about broadcast traffic or multicast traffic. But if they're just talking to each other, PC3 doesn't have to listen and vice versa. So a bridge does all kinds of wonderful things like traffic filtering and making decisions based on MAC address for forwarding. Today, we don't talk about bridges too much because they've been replaced by switches. The exception would be in wireless topologies where we still have a wireless bridge. So that's kind of where bridging comes from. And if we keep those ideas in mind, that is that nodes connected to a bridge or switch are part of the same network, the same layer two network, then we can sort of get a better handle on these other bridging technologies that we're about to discuss. So let's move on to bridge groups. Now bridge groups can refer to either a collection of nodes or interfaces. Now why would you do that? Why would we bother to collect nodes together? Well, it's pretty straightforward for nodes. If they're connected to the same bridge or switch, they can communicate directly together. They share the same layer two address space. But if you put interfaces into the same bridge group, that means that we can forward traffic between them. And we can use the device that's doing the bridging to handle that forwarding. So the config that I have, again, above me here, is an example of an access point build that has a bridge group in it. So if you'll notice that the ethernet and the radio interface are both part of bridge group one. Now the Significant details here are that those two interfaces don't have an IP address, but the bridge virtual interface does. So it's very common for an access point to have a management IP address, but no other IP address. So we're going to manage this access point remotely via the IP address. But if we applied it to the radio interface, or if we just applied it to the Ethernet interface, we could only manage it from one side. And if that side was down for any reason, we couldn't talk to the access point. So the bridge virtual interface was a great way to manage from either side because the IP address was not tied to a physical interface. And we're gonna forward packets between the two interfaces. So that's really the benefit of having a bridge group. It sort of puts the two interfaces together in a connection that can receive traffic from either side. And of course, giving it an IP address allows us to get away from the console connection entirely, which has to be within the limits of EIA 232, the physical distance limits of EIA 232 for connections. But when we're IP addressing, right, we, ha we have the no real limits at all. Well, if we continue this idea of bridge connections, what about virtualization? 
Well, if you spent any time with virtualization, you know that your hypervisor provides your networking connections for your virtual machines. And they come in a variety of flavors. You can have a network address translation connection. You can have a host only that doesn't go anywhere. Or you can have a bridged connection. And a bridged connection means that you share the same network as the host machine's connection. So in the diagram off to the side here, we can see that there's a DHCP server out on the network somewhere. And there's a real switch out there, right? Switch zero in this case. And the host PC is connected to that switch. So the host would get a DHCP-based IP address from the DHCP server. Now the host is running a hypervisor, much like I'm going to show you later on. And the host has a couple of bridged VMs. Now, the examples that we've used so far in this little series is that the VMs get an IP address on the 10 net. That's because they're using NATed connections. If, however, they're using bridged connections, they would get an IP address from the DHCP server out on the physical network. So the DHCP server on the hypervisor is not used. So another example of where we bridge things together, we're sort of gluing the network connection for the VMs to the network connection of the host and putting them on the same network, the same layer two MAC address space and therefore on the same IPv4 network. So what about Linux bridging? Well, from Red Hat, we get the following definition. A Linux bridge is a kernel module that behaves like a network switch. Oh, so it's going to put all of these nodes in a space where they can communicate directly. And the switch is going to forward packets between interfaces that are connected. So we're going to use these kinds of connections to connect VMs, or as we'll see here in a minute, we'll connect interfaces on the same machine to a bridge group. Now there's lots of reasons why you might want to bridge interfaces on a particular node together. Let's say that you just wanted to filter traffic. Now you might filter traffic for access control or you might filter traffic for security reasons. So if the VM itself was say a firewall and you were passing traffic to the firewall, it passes the rules and it goes out the other interface, you might accomplish that with bridged connections. We could load balance that way to a server. We've already talked about management connections. And of course, we've got the virtual machines connections themselves that might be bridged either through a software router or a software switch or the hypervisor chassis itself. Now, when we're doing bridging, we know that physical switches support things like spanning tree protocol and VLANs. Linux bridging does the exact same thing. And there are a number of products that use builds right on top of Linux. OVS, FRR, white box networking are just some examples. Now, before I show you a little bit about the VM that I built, let's talk just a little bit more about the virtual bridge interface itself. So when you create a bridge on a Linux host, you are going to be connecting interfaces, or if that VM or that Linux operating system, like one running Proxmox, is supporting VMs, you would bridge those together. So you're putting them together again as if they were on the same local area network and passing traffic through to, in this case, ETH0, or we might bridge through one of the VMs if the VM had a particular job. Now, it takes a little bit of thinking, you know, what are you trying to do? Which interfaces or VMs do you want to bridge together? But that's really all that we're doing. We're saying we want these VMs to be bridged or these inter interfaces to be bridged together. Well, how do we get this done? Well, that previous quote was from Red Hat. But of course, we're doing things on Ubuntu right now. So we're going to edit our friend that YAML file, and then we're going to apply it using NetPlan. So the config above me here is right off the Ubuntu page, and we'll do something similar. We're going to add a little bit to it. But as you can see, Instead of just adding an IP address like we did last time, what we're going to do now is add an actual bridge to this particular uh, Linux VM. 
And when we build the bridge, we're also going to add to the bridge a couple of interfaces that we're going to bridge together. Now, you could theoretically just bridge a couple of things together and hope that it works. But every once in a while, it's nice to see the status of your bridge. What is it doing? And so there is actually a command that we can use called bridge. Now, there are other ones related to this, IP route 2 and, and bridge control, but bridge control is deprecated. So we're going to use bridge. That's the one we'll demonstrate today. Uh, and it is used to set up, maintain, and inspect the Ethernet bridge configuration. Now, I put a couple of handy uh, commands down there. They're pretty straightforward. But the usage goes like this. You do the command, then you do the option, and then you do the object. We're going to work with something called the forwarding database. All right, let's do this. Let's take a look at our VM. Now, before I show you the VM itself, I want to show you what I changed in the VM. You can set up a bridge with one interface, but it's not a lot of fun. So what I did on this one, I don't know if you can see it right here in the middle, I've added an adapter to this. And what that would allow me to do is pass traffic up one adapter into the VM that might be doing some work of some kind and then back down the, the interface. But really what it does, is it gets us to say, well, I bridged together more than one interface. Other than that, this server is the same as the one in the last video. All right, here is our server itself. And as you know, we start off with the 50 cloud init YAML file. And I copied that over to the 99 config file, right? Just a CP over. And then I edit it. So here's what I did in the edit. So we can see just like before, we have the one interface for ENP S3, MP0 S3. Now that was the first interface. When I added another interface via the hypervisor, I got ENP0 S8 and I gave this one an IP address here. Now here is the extra part that I now added in addition to the address. What I said was I want to add a bridge BR0 and then I put two interfaces into that bridge. So there we go. Okay. We're going to do net plan, whoops, apply. Okay. Now if I do IPA, what do we get out of this? Well, we can see that I have our loopback. We have the previous ENP0 S3, but now we have ENP0 S8. And I have the two IP addresses, 99 and 98. But I also have this BR0 address or interface right here. So that's the last thing on there. Now, this tells me that I've created the bridge interface and that it has its own network connection. But what is in this particular interface? Well, I might say something like this. Let's use, well, first maybe we'll take a look at our man page. We'll say, that's what we're adding today. So this is the man page for bridge, and it's just to show and manipulate the bridge addresses and devices. So from here, or using the bridge command, you can actually add or subtract interfaces, VLANs, and things like that, or you could put them in the YAML file. And you can see that there's a tremendous number of options here. We're getting it's starting to get a little long here, so the only thing that I'm really going to do is take a look at our forwarding database. Now there's a couple of ways to get to this. Well, what do we care about here? Now, maybe what I'll do is um, let's do IPA again, and then we'll, we'll take a look at some stuff in IPA. So if we take a look at ENP0S3, what's the MAC address? Well, it, begin, or it ends with 6AE8, um, and ENPS8 ends with 29B4. So really what we're after is E8 and B4. So now if I take a look at my bridge command, and I see at the top here, 6AE8, and then toward the bottom you'll see 85C2. 
So what we're seeing there is that the MAC addresses for my two interfaces are attached to this particular bridge. And the bridge knows and understands those MAC addresses and would make forwarding rules, forwarding decisions based on those MAC addresses and then adhere to any rules that I had describing uh, what to do with traffic for those MAC addresses, like a VLAN or something like that. So feel free to play around with bridge and making your bridges on your Linux VM. Well, I think that'll about do it for this one. We've covered where bridges come from, right? That's our friend, the IEEE 802.1D standard. Now today we use 802.1Q, which is sort of subsumed all of the 802.1D uh, chocolatey crunchy goodness. We also talked about virtual bridging in hypervisors and of course our Linux kernel. Gluing interface into, into the same layer two network and therefore the same IPv4 address space so that we can do all kinds of fun stuff like bridge VMs to the outside world, like use virtual machines to perform some task like switching or routing or a firewall. And of course, we took a look at the bridge command itself. Well, thanks very much for watching. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you got something out of this video. Like and subscribe if I help. And may those packets always reach their destination no matter how many bridge interfaces you're going through.